Hey guys, Taki here. It's the season of product refreshes for AMD handhelds, and most companies are busy upgrading their older Ryzen 6000 series handhelds to the new Phoenix Point APUs that launched this month. I've had my hands on this guy for about three weeks now, and it takes the title as the most powerful handheld that I've used so far. A couple of months ago, we looked at the INEO Geek and the INEO 2, but this is the INEO 2S, and even though it does look similar to those other models, we do have a bunch of small changes in this that make it a decent upgrade or a product refresh. So for those of you guys that don't know, the 2S has a front sheet of glass across most of the device, and this was largely done to help hide the bezels. I only used this white version for my initial first look last year, and I think it's the best best version of this that they sell in terms of appearance. The cool thing is that they've added a white color option to the Geek, and that one also looks awesome. On the 2S, you have two large Hall Effect joysticks. These are the same size as the ones that are used in the Steam Deck, and they have an RGB light around them that you can customize in the software. We also have a set of conductive rubber ABXY buttons and a D-pad that can pivot well. At first glance, the shoulder buttons appear to be the same, but they redesigned this analog Hall Effect trigger to make less noise. As you press the button down completely, it has a piece of cushion to catch the button, so it's really quiet. The older model could kind of bang against the PCB, especially if you're playing games that made quick use of R2 and L2. It's a nice quality of life improvement. Near those buttons, you'll find another one of our changes, and it's kind of a small one. I wonder if you can notice it. In my main video, I talked about how these things were really annoying to remove because you couldn't get a pry tool in there to get them out. But now it's super easy. Now you can even get this out if you don't have a tool and you just use your finger. I don't have this screwed in, so this isn't completely flush right now, but this is a huge upgrade if you're someone that plans on doing some DIY upgrades to your device. And if I just show you like the worst side of my old one, that one got beat to hell, but there's no way that's gonna happen now with this new one. The bottom end doesn't have any changes. I think the speakers are still the same. We still have bottom firing ones. We still have a headphone jack here on the bottom, and we have a small little flap here so we can use an SD card. Also still have the same type C port on the bottom that is useful if you own a dock from this company. Most of the top is the same as it was. We still have two hotkey buttons on either end of the device. We have a fingerprint combo power button, volume buttons, and two additional USB type C ports. You might notice that we now have a huge cutout for air exhaust, and that's for good reason. Cooling on this device is much better than it was before. If you just look at both models together, you can see that they were really trying to increase airflow. Now they achieved this added cooling efficiency that you're gonna see in just a moment by doing a bunch of small things here that together improve thermal performance by around 10 Celsius compared to the older model. This right here is a disassembled 2S that's on loan and has to go back, but I do have the kit and all of the components that it would take to upgrade an INEO 2. The biggest physical change is the third heat pipe on the copper heatsink. Outside of that, they applied graphite sheets in a lot of places. There's a big one that goes over most of the back plate, and they also have some pads that go on either side of the battery. We'll cover this in more detail in a later video. Before we go any further, let's quickly go over the specs of the prototype that I have. The INEO 2S comes with a Ryzen 7 7840U processor. This system officially supports a TDP range of 5 watts to 35 watts, but this processor does go all the way up to 53 watts in other products and in the prototype that I have. Our GPU is a Radeon 780M with a max clock of 2.7 gigahertz, and I have 32 gigabytes of LP DDR5 RAM running at 6400 stock. This can be changed to 7500 in the BIOS. More on that later. So compared to the last generation on paper, our CPU is better and our GPU is better. The reality is a little different and it's gonna come down to the game that you're playing. So if there's a game that's demanding on the CPU side, then you'll see a benefit with this processor. But for handhelds like these with APUs, we're really limited by our GPU, not by our CPU. So look for emulation to be better and for PC games to be kind of situational. There are a subset of games that are just better on RDNA 3 GPUs and there aren't a lot of them, but they do run better at like the same power profile. Like if everything else was the same, they're just going to run better. And I'm gonna give you kind of like a best case scenario, which is Doom Eternal running on 7840U versus 6800U. So here's Doom Eternal. If we go into the settings, you can see that we're at 800p with the graphics set to Nightmare. And in this scene right here, we're at 106 FPS without doing anything. We're at 22 watt TDP, so this can go higher than this, but let's just see what we can do. Pay attention to this static scene in particular. Here, we're getting around 77 FPS. If we bump our TDP up to 40 watts, we only gain about 10 FPS and our GPU usage is maxed out. The starting area is now at 109 FPS, and if we run out and go down the hall, our min FPS increases to 81. Now we've got that same game again, but this time I've changed the RAM to 7500 in the BIOS. 
At 22 watt TDP, our FPS is just a tad better than it was without the RAM change, but we are still maxing out our GPU at 99%. We're now at 109 at 22 watt TDP. If we go down the hall, our average FPS is about the same, but our minimum FPS takes a drop with an explosion. The point is that a RAM change alone doesn't really make up a lot of ground, even in an ideal game like this. If we idle at the end of the hall, we're at 77 FPS. If we bump up to 40 watt TDP, we are about 3 FPS higher than we were with slower RAM. Our max FPS goes up by 7 or 8 FPS in the doorway. For some reason, I can't force this game to go to 53 watt TDP to get a maximum reading, but I could with an earlier BIOS. Now we're on the IA Neo 2 with the 6800U back at 22 watt TDP. On average, we're probably about 7 or 8 FPS lower than we were on the 7840U using the same TDP. We can match or exceed the 22 watt performance of the 7840U on the 6800U, but we need to be at around 27 or 28 watt TDP to make that happen. That's going to cover it for this small section, but I can cover more stuff like this in a future video if people are interested. Now let's take a look at some performance benchmarks starting out with Geekbench 5. On the INEO 2S, I got a single core score of 1646 and a multi-core score of 10403. By the way, this is max TDP performance. On the ROG Ally, we got a score of 1465 single core and 9541 multi. This is using the stock configuration. ROG has a cap on the max CPU clocks. It should be possible to match the other score without that limitation in place. I also ran the Vulcan test and I got a bit over 35,000 on the 2S. The Ally is close behind with a score of 33,000 at max TDP. And that just leaves us with Time Spy, and I was able to get a score of 3539 overall with my unit. I got a bit over 3000 for graphics and just under 10,000 for CPU. My prior high score before today was 3525 overall with a slightly higher CPU score. The GPU score was a bit lower and that lowered my overall score. On the Ally, my highest score was 3193 overall with 2866 for graphics and 9067 for CPU. Now it's time to take a look at some performance tests. And before we get started, I just want to say to anyone that's wondering, I have this device connected to the OmniCase 2, and I have my games running off the charge disc that I did a video on recently. This dock is nice because it has audio output, and I think it cleans up my filming area by having one less wire. If you're interested in any of these, including the awesome charging cable that I'm using, you can find links to them in the description box below. We're going to do things a bit differently for this. Usually on first look videos, I'll showcase a ton of games, but I decided to do a few games and then showcase how the performance scales at different TDP levels. So inside the settings, you can see that I'm using custom settings. I have FSR set to balance, and if I go down, everything else is on the lowest settings possible, and this is at 1200p resolution, but I'm going to change this to 800p. I'm making a point to show this to you because I've seen a lot of videos on this processor with misleading settings listed. So this is 800p, lowest settings, with FSR set to balance, and you can see at 15 watt TDP in this city, we're getting decent FPS. Our FPS is around 45 to 50. Let's take a look at how things change when we're at 22 watt TDP. This is 22 watt TDP with the force 2 watt boost from IS space, and our max FPS is now in the 80s with a minimum that is above 60. This is pretty good performance for this TDP. I would probably change FSR to a better option at this level, but let's take a look at 28 watt. At 28 watt, we now have a max FPS in the 90s with a minimum around 70. Again, I would probably change the graphical settings if I was to play this for myself, but I'm just showing this off. Now let's go into the settings, and let's change our resolution to 1200p. As a recap, this is 1200p, lowest settings, with FSR set to balance. At 30 watt, we're getting about the same performance that we were getting at 15 watt, 800p. We're getting good FPS here at just a bit under 60 FPS, and all things considered, this is really good. Our CPU load isn't that high, but our GPU is almost maxed out. Now let's go into the settings again, and this time I'm going to turn FSR to performance so we can see what this gets at 1200p with the lowest settings. This is 1200p with the worst quality that you can get. Again, not bad, but hopefully this is a more realistic representation of how this game behaves on this processor. Our next title is another one that runs better on 7840U. This is Borderlands 3, and I have the settings set to the lowest possible, and we're at 1200p resolution. This will work backwards compared to the last clip. We're starting out at the maximum TDP that I want to show off in this video, which is 28 watt TDP with a 2 watt boost. In this scene right here with not a lot going on, you can see that our FPS is pretty good. We're about 50 to 76, but it can dip down as we start fighting some of these monsters. As we start fighting more of these, we're going to be between 60 and 70 FPS. We get dips down to 52, but this is still highly playable. Now let's change our TDP to 22 watts and see what happens. Surprisingly, our FPS doesn't really change all that much. 
I think it's more stable than it was before. We're basically at around 50 to low 60s. Our min FPS doesn't really change all that much, but our maximum does. The important thing to note here is that this is using a lot less power to get this performance. It's a lot more than just 6 watts. When we switch a weapon, we can get some loading lag here down to the 40s, but all in all, it is still running well. Now let's bring this down to 15 watt TDP. At this level, we're getting around 30 to 40 FPS depending on what we're doing. This is great performance for this level of power consumption, but I would probably play this at a higher TDP just to get close to 60. Now let's go into the visual settings, and let's change our resolution to 800p to see how that changes things. With these settings at 15 watt, we're getting great performance. I think if I was on battery power, I would take this because we're using considerably less power at this point. We still have some dips as things are loading in here, but once everything is loaded, our FPS is pretty stable at around 60 or so. We even hold up well in combat, but explosions will drop us down to 30 FPS. Those dips move up to the 50s at 22 watt TDP with a 2 watt boost. Our next title is Sekiro. Now we're going to start at 15 watt TDP, max settings, 800p resolution. This is great performance for this amount of power consumption. I can remember when this game was hard to run even on low settings at 720p. With this TDP, we're basically going to average around 45 FPS depending on what we're doing. It can go up or down with more mobs on screen, but that's a solid average for this area. Let's go change this to 22 watts because that's where we're going to see a huge improvement. At this TDP, we can max out the FPS with an average of 60 regardless of what we do. It's really solid. We now need to go into the graphical settings and change our resolution to 1200p. So at 1200p with max settings, we can get an average of 35 to 37 FPS which is still pretty good. We get highs into the mid 40s and I would say this is comparable to the 15 watt TDP performance at 800p. It also looks great on this screen. But let's bump this up to 28 watt TDP to see if we can improve things. Surprisingly, we don't get a lot more performance with this boost. I was expecting that we would get at least over 50 in these scenes, but we're not really seeing that big of a change. Our average FPS only changed by about 2 or 3, but that comes after using considerably more power. The interesting thing here is that our GPU clock speed is also pretty far from the max clock, so I don't know if we could get better performance than this if we were to alter the clocks by ourselves, but this is what we're getting here. But yeah, I'm just doing this so you can get a good idea of what this processor can and can't do, and so you can see how it operates under a bunch of different scenarios that you can repeat on your own devices. If you have a handheld, you can try to match what I'm doing here on your hardware to see what kind of upgrade this would be for you, especially if you have a 6800U or a Steam Deck. Our last game is Red Dead Redemption 2. This is another game that runs better on this new processor. For our settings, we're at 800p with everything set to the lowest with no FSR enabled. I'm over here at the beginning of this game in this idle position. I'll just tilt the camera around so you can see how the FPS changes. We don't have V-Sync enabled, so you might see some tearing in this footage, but we are about 50 to 60 FPS in this area. As we walk out of here and get closer to the other buildings, our FPS does drop down to the low 50s or high 40s, but it's still pretty good. Now let's bump the resolution up to 1200p, and let's increase the TDP to 28 watts and walk the same path. You can see that our performance isn't that far from what it was at 15 watts at 800p resolution. Even though these numbers aren't that high, this is a really demanding game, especially at 1200p resolution. We are putting up good numbers on the 2S. Finally, let's go into the options and turn FSR to performance. This is going to represent the lowest possible quality that you can get while still being at 1200p. After we do that, we get over 60 FPS in some of these views. And just to round out this, here's 800p in the same area with no FSR. But that's going to wrap up things on this first look. I'll have more coverage on this device over the next week or so. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, feel free to take a look at my video on the A1 Pro. It's another handheld with this processor and slightly slower RAM. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.